Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so today uh, we're pleased to have Professor Alexandra Boldareva visiting us from um, Georgia Institute of Technology, and she will speak about deterministic and efficiently searchable encryption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, can you hear me well? Is the mic on? Okay, good. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I changed a little bit the title and the talk just slightly from what was announced in the abstract. I hope it's okay. I included some uh, new and probably more applied things. So, And this talk is based on several works I did jointly with Mihir Bilarius, Serge Feher, and uh, my student Adam O'Neill. These are the talks which I will cover mostly, but if I have time, I hope I will. I will also include some other things which were done together with students at Georgia Tech, Gorgas Amanatidis, Nate Chinette, and Yuna Lee, who is actually a visiting postdoc. Okay, so the plan of my talk, I'll tell you about the focus uh, and motivation for looking at these things. Then we'll talk about the problem of defining security for deterministic encryption and why it's a problem. Uh, then we'll see several very efficient and secure constructions. Some will be in the random oracle model. And then we'll see other constructions which are slightly less efficient. Well, some of them more less efficient, but they're secure without uh, relying on the random oracle model and we'll see some general constructions and extended general constructions and we'll discuss their uh, specific instantiations and finally we'll talk about uh, more general primitives efficiently searchable encryption which doesn't have to be deterministic and finally, we'll discuss uh, the problem of deterministic encryption in the symmetric key setting, because most of the talk is going to focus on the public key, asymmetric key setting. And I also want to talk about more flexible database queries and uh, encryption schemes designed specifically for this problem. OK, so let's go uh, with this. We'll start with the main topic. So. Classical security definitions for encryption. If you're familiar, it's good. If not, it's also OK. But if you know this standard notions in distinguishability against chosen plain text attacks and against chosen cipher text attack, INDCP and INDCCA, they require encryption scheme to be randomized. And so why is that? Because these are really strong properties. They say encryption shouldn't leak any partial information about the message, should be very, very secure. And But deterministic encryption, and by deterministic encryption I mean just when the encryption algorithm doesn't use any randomness. So if you encrypt the same message twice, you get the same cipher text with deterministic encryption. And such encryption does leak information inherently. Just that information, you can see when the same message is encrypted twice. And because of this, in my lectures, I teach my students that uh, deterministic encryption is not good. Remember that. It just cannot be good. It has to be randomized. And in fact, it's not a problem. There are tons of uh, efficient, provably secure, randomized encryption schemes out there. But in my talk, I'm going to look at deterministic encryption, which I usually say is no good. <laughs> and so why is that? Why am I doing this? Uh, there is some reason for doing this. Because uh, database researchers at Georgia Tech brought some 
practical problem to me. Uh, I didn't know about before. And it, the problem is, f is fast search on encrypted, remotely stored data. We'll discuss it in more detail. And it turns out that deterministic encryption is what can be very useful there. So there is some reason to look at this. So we'll talk about this more. Uh, uh, other than that, there are some other reasons why it may be interesting. Uh, randomized encryption, the ciphertext has to include randomness, so it's longer than the message. But deterministic encryption, in principle, can be length preserving, which may be useful, again, in some particular applications. Uh, late after we studied this, we just discovered some relation to some other notion, uh, which has a it's called convergent encryption, used for a totally different problem for secure storage and checking consistency of the storage. Uh, and just it's interesting from a theoretical point of view and also from historical standpoint because uh, when public encryption appeared, it was first designed in the form of deterministic encryption. Uh, okay, so let's look at the main application I mentioned, uh, outsource that databases. So what's the problem? So Apparently nowadays it's becoming more and more popular for companies and organizations to outsource data storage and most importantly management uh, to external service providers. So it's cheap to store but to manage it's better let it do the specialists. But this external service, external service providers do not have to be fully trusted. So I may trust them to store and manage my data, but I don't want them to read everything. And security may be even required by law, like for example, for in the case of a medical data. Uh, so what is the setting? Mostly in my talk, I will look at the public key setting, but at the end, we will talk about the symmetric key setting. So what is the setting? We have the external uh, service provider, database server, and anyone who knows the public key of some distinguished receiver can submit data. For example, like uh, nurses, let's imagine pharmacists, can submit some records about some patients to the database and then the doctor who has the secret key uh, should be able to query the database, ask it for specific records, get them back and decrypt and read the data. So this is the setting and we want to do it securely. Okay, so I guess you can ask, ask me questions anytime, I don't mind. Yeah, sure. So wouldn't it suffice just to keep the the hash of the data alongside the randomized encrypted data? Good point. Yes, and we will, yes, I will. It's one of the solutions which was actually, of course, proposed, mentioned by the database scientists. Right, so uh, I will talk about it. It's also, it's a solution that it will not to be, it doesn't have to be much better, but it's good, and we'll discuss it at the end. Well, not at the end, but after. Yes, it's there. Yeah. If really anyone can put data in, it's going to be a nightmare of data corruption and pollution. So we, of course, so we, in reality, we would assume the database server would also have some kind of authorization service on top. So, it, but it, it's an extra layer. But, but by anyone, we mean anyone good who we want to. <laughs> no, uh, not quite. We'll see. Right. So but I'm not saying it's a terribly hard problem. No, but it's, we'll see some small things you have, have to take care of. Oh, that, that's a very simple setting. So, but even, and we want to do it securely. Uh, so in principle, when this database people uh, told me the problem, I said, but there is a good solution which was recently proposed and it's better than the solution which you told me with the hash uh, because it provides really strong security where 
even though we didn't discuss it, but very good security. So, and it's called encryption with keyword search, public encryption with keyword search, APEX, designed by Dan Bano and others uh, not long ago. And in this, it, it could be used and really good formally analyzed security. In this solution, the, the user, the doctor in my example, will send, a, send a, some, uh, the server some trapdoor uh, and it's generated using the doctor's secret key, only the doctor can do it. And then the server will test this trapdoor against the data, encrypted data stored in the database and will find uh, records matching it. Really good security, nothing is leaked, well, almost really strong security there. And I told them, here's the solution, really good. But they told me like, and they told me, are you crazy? We are not, this solution requires the database server to go over the whole database. And theoretically for me, it sounds good, but they say, no, we have like terabytes and terabytes of data and on each query, no way we're gonna go over the whole database. That's insane. And no, we wanna do it fast. Uh, fast, meaning we wanna index the data and locate it very efficiently. On each query, can't you batch up these queries? Like every minute runs start running. And you get latency. You have latency problem. What, what, what does it mean? You, but you said on each query. On each you can run the, uh, to a single, single linear search of the database and deal with 100 queries. But, uh, in, do you mean in parallel? Yeah, well, yeah. I don't want that it fit any of the 100 queries. But it's, even if it's just one query, it's a long time to go, they don't want to do it. Yeah, I guess it's possible, but they say it's not practical enough. Uh, so, and the, but I said, it's a, if then, if you want to do it faster, it's not possible to have this really good security. And they say, that's okay. Fast is important, and then what's the best we can do with this constraint? And uh, actually, uh, database researchers already, they try to come up with some solutions themselves. And what you mentioned was one of the solution. And another was, uh, and so maybe it's good to mention, what's the problem? What, what's the problem if we just encrypt all data with the randomized encryption and send it? So what's the problem? The problem is, so if this sender uses some random coins to create a ciphertext of the message and then the client wants to locate this message and encrypts it, uh, he's gonna get a new ciphertext because it's randomized, it's very good, and just there is no way to point to this. So this is just uh, uh, why randomized encryption itself is not good. And so they say, okay, let's just use deterministic encryption. The sender would encrypt the message, and for the query, the user just encrypt the message. And so they are the same, and they can be used as a query. Mm -hmm. And the server can index using at this. Uh, deterministic encryption. And so they say we already have these good solutions. So, but uh, no formal analysis was given, which is understandable, but we wanted just to study more this problem to see whether these solutions are good and what security does this provide. So just formally, we wanted to look at this. And so we started to look at this and uh, I already told you so, with deterministic solution, it's indeed works, works meaning I don't know how secure it is, but the receiver would encrypt something. So here's the example, it sends uh, a review of, for some paper, public key of the author, uh, the title and the review encrypted, the server stores, and then the author wants to retrieve the review, sends, encrypts the title, so it's the C ciphertext coincides. And we assume the server before uh, indexed it, so it has some, uses some data structure to index it, and then when the query comes, it can very fast, logarithmic time, I guess, uh, locate this record and return uh, the other part and the author can decrypt. So it seems to work. But formally, we usually, we want to analyze how secure is it. And you, you just want 
define some security. So formally, just to understand what is it. Uh, oops. No. And um, so I already mentioned that deterministic encryption cannot satisfy the standard notions of security and DCP and DCCA. So we need something else. Uh, and so, and in fact, you may notice that since we're in the public key setting, if the message space is really small, you cannot have good security at all, just intuitively, because everyone can encrypt. So you can exhaustively encrypt all messages in the small space and just see what ciphertext they match, and so you would know. So for this, you have to assume your message space is large. So, and whenever we look at the uh, public key setting and deterministic encryption, you have to assume you're dealing with a large message space. But still, what is the definition of security? Uh, cryptographers knew one definition which is suitable for deterministic encryption for a long time. It's just one way, it's just basically saying looking at the ciphertext of a randomly chosen message, you cannot recover the message. So you cannot go back if you don't know the secret key. But for these applications, it seems too weak. So maybe I cannot recover the whole message, but I can recover half of the message. Just doesn't seem strong enough. And it seems like it's possible to do better. So it's good to have a better security definition, a stronger one. So. And we tried to come up with this. So the first card, let's try uh, just to ask that the ciphertext of a message drawn from a large space, uh, by looking at it and knowing the public key, of course, no adversary, efficient adversary, can compute any function of the message. Okay, so that uh, seems like a good idea. Uh, of course, you always, so, but you want to say cannot compute with good probability, but some function, for example, first bit of the message, you can always guess with just probability one half. So we would just say no one, no adversary should do, compute this better than some adversary who is not given a ciphertext. Even without ciphertext, you can guess uh, the first bit of the message. So it's not a good attack. But if you can do something non-trivial from the ciphertext, this is what, yeah? Uh, it seems impossible. If FN is a public key encryption of the message, and trivial is an adversary can compute it. Good, meaning the, ci the ciphertext itself, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. So this is what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, so I'll just nevertheless go briefly to the point, and uh, it's good. So that's why I said that the first try. And so we'll have to fix it. So, and we're just trying to realize it, fix the encryption scheme. So even though we're thinking of deterministic encryption, the, in the definition, it doesn't really matter. It's just some definition of security. And it will cover your solution to your proposed with the hash. So the definition is still of what we're going to say. So we consider the adversary, uh, which we just divide by like two parts, cooperating two guys. But they don't share, they can exchange information, even though uh, they can know of each other's algorithm. And we think of the experiment. So the first guy outputs a message drawn from a large space, should have some min entropy in it, and some string target representing this final information they have to guess about the message. And later, the other guy will be given the ciphertext of this message and the public key, and has to guess this target information. So this is what it's represented. So one experiment, first guy outputs the message and some target, some string, which can have first bit, uh, anything, half of the bits. And then we encrypt, give the ciphertext to the other guy, and he has to guess this target the first guy created. And if it guesses, we say it's, it wins. This is one experiment. And in the other experiment, the adversary it's the same, but the adversary is uh, given some bogus message, and it has to guess some information about totally unrelated message. So this is just to ex exclude trivial attacks. So this guy is just not given the ciphertext. So it seems reasonable, but you caught me. So exactly. 
under this, which seems natural definition, no scheme is secure, regardless of whether the message space is large or not. Just this target, if it's a ciphertext, deterministic ciphertext, is some information which is leaked. And this definition was kind of targeting high. It says no information should be leaked, but it, it is leaked by functionality. It just has to be leaked. Therefore, it's, it doesn't work. Well, it's just too strong definition for our primitive. So, but it seemed good, so we just tried to fix it. Yeah. This adversary looks like the, uh, the, the pair of players in bridge, uh, you know, playing as one player, but good. not having communication. That's a good model? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before it lays down, right? When they, yeah. But then they share some information, the one reveals one, right? If, if it's, yeah. oh, but the, the other pair, right, exactly. <laughs> Sorry for the detour. Okay, so, I, but the definition looked good. There was just one problem and we tried to fix it. How to fix it? Well, kind of trivially, we just say, uh, we are not gi gonna give the public key to this guy. So it cannot output the ciphertext. Well, it's not, ideal, but it's the only way we see how to fix it. What it means is that now it, it says the definition would protect the data which does not depend on the public key. We th uh, in practice it's probably okay. P public keys are usually hidden in some software. No? And, uh, not as well as people think they are hidden. Right. So, well, our definition is going to hide information about messages not depending on the public key. That's the only thing we could do. Yeah. And I think it's still fine for most applications, but it's good to realize we cannot do better. Now, the, the previous attack does not apply, and the definition seems achievable. So, that's one. And in fact, this is one of the definitions. We call it brief one, one, brief of pri Privacy, uh, one means just one message. Uh, in the standard notions, again, whether you know them or not, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's, it looks something like this. The adversary outputs messages and then gets ciphertext and ha then guess, has to guess something. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether the adversary asks just one message or many messages. Polynomial, it's still the same. Uh, and the question, is it the same for our definition too? Uh, so, and by the way, yeah, so in, under this definition we say the definition is prev one CPA chosen plain text attack secure if it's just no efficient adversary can do much better in the first experiment than in the other. Uh, but we can consider just the exact same experiment where it's not one message but a vector of messages. And the target information represents some, some information from the whole vector. It's reasonable. It, in the standard setting for randomized encryption, it doesn't matter much. So for simplicity, you can just consider one message. Here, we'll see. So, but first we, wait, we just do that. It's just a vector now. That's several messages. Okay, so, and we just, uh, any restrictions on the message? So you can, uh, we're still going to work with large message space. This is not going to go away. Uh, so each message, which means uh, each message is hard to guess. Hyman entropy. Otherwise, the definition, we cannot achieve it. But still, uh, there are several possibilities. And one possibility, we say that each message is hard to guess, but other than that, they can be arbitrarily dependent. You can have a message x, which is random, and the second message can be x plus 1, the second message can be x plus 3. It's allowed, still, each message is hard to guess. And this is the definition which we call brief CPA. We'll see whether they're equivalent or strong or not. But you also can consider a weaker definition, a stronger restriction on the message, uh, on the messages when we say each message hard to guess given the others. 
So my previous example, well, we had the random message and random message plus one is not, it, uh, does not satisfy this restriction because once you're given x, you, the x plus one is not hard to guess, right? So, and this is called block sources. Uh, and in the example, for example, we, if we consider uh, phone numbers, you can know that some uh, numbers share the same prefix because they're from the same area. But even knowing that, they're dependent, but still given one, it's hard to guess the other. So this would still satisfy this weaker definition. Uh, so we have these two variations. And uh, the question, so what are the relations between these definitions? And we just studied so we know what is strongest, what is equivalent. Uh, and so our results are uh, that the definition for one message is strictly weaker than the strongest definition for vector of messages. And this is different from the case from the standard encryption. It's good to know. The other result is actually the middle one, brief CPA for block sources turns out to be equivalent to the definition with just one message. So for simplicity, we, uh, we can just start, uh, in work with this one for block sources, and this is going to be our strongest one. It's interesting, the second result is way more, it's way harder to show than the first one, and uh, use some ideas from works of Dodis and Smith on entropic security and some other recent works, some French names I forgot, uh, which looked also on entropic security. It's all in the information theoretic, not computational, and symmetric setting. And the last two works actually for the quantum setting, but the techniques are very useful. But what's important is the result. We just know how do the definitions relate. Now we have the definitions, and um, oh, almost, I, as usual, so if you know, uh, it makes sense to always consider stronger definitions in terms of not only chosen plain text attack, where the adversary has some, uh, can choose messages, but also chosen ciphertext attacks, when the adversary is allowed to see decryptions of ciphertext of its choice, chosen ciphertext, in addition to chosen plain text. And we can just make our definition, take this chosen ciphertext into account in the standard way, just given the adversary the decryption oracle. So we do this, it's just pretty standard. And then we have uh, all these definitions with CCA, chosen ciphertext attack. This is just the stronger version. And it, it's always good to target for the stronger chosen ciphertext attacks. And the same uh, relations hold. So now we have definitions. It's time to look at the constructions. And uh, first constructions are going to be in the random oracle model. Uh, so what is this? It's, there's some, it's not real. It's an idealized model, which assumes the hash functions. Uh, actually, ideal objects, uh, they're just purely random functions all parties have uh, oracle access to. OK? In this model, it's not very hard to come up with secure constructions. And one of the constructions, we call it encrypt with hash. It's pretty intuitive. So we have any encryption scheme. It has randomness in it. We, we want deterministic scheme. So we just make the randomness. We replace it with some deterministic function of the message, namely hash of the message. Hash the message, this, and then use any randomized encryption scheme and substitute random coins with the hash of the message. And you can decrypt too. Um, so this may be a bit better than your solution just because ciphertext is going to be shorter, for example, for this reason, because hash is within the ciphertext, but pretty much the same idea. So it's a deterministic encryption scheme, and we show that in the random oracle model, if I assume hash is ideal, it satisfies the stronger notion of security. If the scheme we took is CPA, you get brief CPA. And if you take a CCA-based scheme, and also if it satisfies some very, very minor 
constraint which is satisfied by all practical schemes, so it's not a big deal. You get brief CCA scheme, deterministic scheme. Okay, so one simple construction. Uh, just a, okay, so I'll repeat, yeah, so his idea was a uh, very easy solution. Take any randomized scheme, it's going to be randomized, encrypt the message, plus hash the message and append the hash. And it's not deterministic encryption, but for the application of search, you will just use hash as the tag and location. So then you can't do searchable. You do, you do. do each word no, no, no. Right, so you would... You keep the hash in a separate field, and then you can search on that. So you yeah, read so it, it's built word by hash. word, index hashes of Mess words Mess and hashes of words. Well, in, even in my Mess case, Mess I was looking at encryption of what, if it's a field or word, one cell, whatever this is, I'm looking at encryption and indexing by that. So if a ciphertext just contains the hash in it, you just look at that. Yeah, I don't know whether you put it separately or not. Instead of the whole ciphertext being the tag on which you index, you just use hash part. And to decrypt, you use the ciphertext, which is randomized. Yeah, Does it make that sense? Would be really inefficient for if you have to do word by like you have. It would only be word by for exact match. Yeah. But it's all for exact match so far. So I don't think this is pretty much the same to me efficiency-wise. It's not that it's better. I'm just looking at, but still, if I want to locate the word, I just hash it, and if the server indexed it by it, but it, it, it's the same. Okay? What's the, what's the constraint on the encryption scheme? Uh, so we say... As long as no ciphertext occurs with too high a probability when encrypting any given message. And this is for randomized encryption. And it actually seems, from looking at it, it seems like it follows from just the CPA requirement. It just seems, of course. Actually, it does not. You can have contrived scheme which do not, but all practical schemes have this. And it's really easy to check for any scheme, so it's not a constraint at all. Uh, another scheme which we designed, slightly more complicated, but not much. It resembles, if you're familiar with the standardized RSA OAP encryption scheme, but it uses three rounds in, in terms of two rounds. So these are the hashes, and this is the RSA function applied to the output of this transform. And also the difference, the RSA function does not have to be applied to the whole message, the whole transform, just the part. So uh, variable message length is okay. And the result is that what we get is a length preserving scheme. The first one was not length preserving because we used hash in, in place of the randomness. It was some extra. Here it can be length preserving, nothing on top. And we show that it's also satisfied the strongest notion, brief CCA, in the random oracle model, assuming one wayness of the RSA function. Okay. Uh, so the, now let's look at the construction without assuming this idealistic random oracles. And uh, both of the schemes were first designed are in the random oracle model. It's very common to first, whenever you have the first primitive, to realize it, assuming random oracles, it's convenient. Uh, it's not that bad, but everyone realizes it's an idealistic model. It's a good heuristic, but strictly speaking, proofs of security in this model do not guarantee security in the strongest sense. So it's always good to have something without random oracles. Even though, again, it's common, without random oracle schemes turn to be less efficient. But still, it's good to know you can do it. And there are several works which raised concern, actually, there are more than what's listed here, that they can raise concern about the soundness of the random oracle model. You can have schemes which are secure in it, but in practice, no way. But they are very contrived, so we still hope for good schemes, it's okay. So it's interesting to see whether you can do deterministic encryption uh, in the standard model, random oracle devoid model. And so we managed to get some positive results. 
but only for this weaker definition security for block sources. High restrictions on the message space, still probably good for some applications, uh, like social security numbers, phone numbers. Uh, it is still an open question, seems to be very hard. We'll see. Seems to be very hard to achieve uh, the strongest definition in the st without random oracles. We'll see. It will be interesting to see if it's possible. Uh, so our constructions uh, use as building blocks some recently introduced primitives called lossy trapdo functions and all but one trapdo functions introduced by Picker and Waters. In very recently, uh, the goal was different. They were looking for constructing randomized INDCC encryption schemes. But the primitives seems to be very useful, and we will use them. So let's briefly review them. So what does it mean, a lossy trapdoor function? It's a trapdoor function, one way. There is some trapdoor with which you can invert. But it operates in two modes. Basically, the key generation can generate two types of the keys. So one is a normal mode, invertible, hard to invert without knowing the secret key. Uh, but if you know the secret key, you can invert. But the other mode is lossy, meaning it just loses some information about the input and you cannot invert. And the other restriction, the modes are indistinguishable. If you're given these two keys, which yield two different modes, you, you don't know what is the case. And there are several constructions under different assumptions were given in that paper. And what we observe is that if you're just concerned about security against chosen plain text attacks, it's easy. If you get a lossy trapdoor function, and if you look at it lossy mode, by the way, this lossy mode, an invertible one, it's used only in the proofs. In the reality, you always use the normal one. But this lossy mode is very useful in the proofs. Uh, so this, uh, if you look at this lossy mode, and if you, if you see that it acts as a universal hash function, there is this property. It, it's not quite important what it is, but there is a property. It's a non-cryptographic property. If, the, if, if this lossy mode has this property, then immediately this lossy trapdoor function gives you deterministic encryption secure in the sense pre for block sources. Because it's used in the normal mode, it, you can decrypt. It's function deterministic. And you can show that it's indeed secure for block sources or for the equivalent definition with just one message. And the proof is rather easy. It just uses the leftover hash lemma. And uh, so it's pretty straightforward. And uh, so we'll talk. We'll, and the, we I will tell you, I guess I'll later have a slide, that the constructions of lossy trapdoor functions, which were provided by Picard and Waters, they satisfy this restriction for the one of them. So it has this universal lossy mode, so it can be used. We'll discuss it. Uh, but what about the stronger security against chosen cipher text attacks? So it's uh, slightly more involved, and we use the other primitive used by uh, these people to construct randomized encryption scheme. So all but one trapdoor function is a generalization of a lossy function. Uh, it has an additional input, a set of branches or modes you can also call. One branch specify a lossy function, but all other specify normal and vertible functions. And again, you cannot tell which is which. By given a branch, you cannot tell. So it's just more, slightly more general. And again, several constructions are there. And so if we have, and this is our construction of deterministic encryption scheme, it's different from the construction of Picker waters, which use one-time signature scheme, which seem to be hard to de-randomize. And this is how a ciphertext in our scheme would look like. So here we have some hash function. This is a lossy trapdoor function. And this is this all but one function. And this hash specifies a branch. And you can decrypt. It's deterministic. 
and we show that it is secure. Uh, actually, it's either PREF1 or PREF for block sources. It's a type of this uh, intermediate notion. If hash, so this is a lossy trap the function with the universal uh, lossy mode. This is all but one function, again, with universal branch. And this is a hash function which is both universal and target collision resistant. It's a weaker notion than standard collision resistance. Under these assumptions, uh, we show that this is brief for block sources. OK, so this was general construction. What about instantiations? As I said, uh, the DDH, Decisional Diffie-Hellman based construction provided by Picator Waters, has universal mode, so we can just plug it in. But we need, uh, for the CCA construction, we need hash, which is both universal and target collision resistant. To the best of my knowledge, it's the first time when these two properties are needed together. Usually it's one or another. But so if we want to work with this DDH assumption, well, we found some schemes, some constructions actually of existing hash functions. And we show that they satisfy both these properties. And we show this for two popular groups where DDH is hard. So we have the, in, under the DDH assumption, we have everything. But this constructions of lossy trapdoor functions and all but one trapdoor functions based on, based on DDH, which were provided uh, in, the, in the other paper. So they are inefficient. They're actually bit by bit in the matrix form, not very efficient. So we wanted to do more, something more efficient. And, but the other constructions, for example, the head constructions of these lossy functions based on uh, this, uh, uh, Palier's base encryption, the other assumption, but they, they didn't seem to have universal lossy modes, and this is additional thing we needed, so uh, didn't seem to work. And for that, we just def designed a trick to our general construction, which allows us to avoid this additional restriction. So we just modify our construction by using a pairwise independent but invertible hash functions. If you have this, and there are some constructions which you can have, and if you process the message first with these hash functions, then we say that the assumptions can be weakened altogether. You don't need universal lossy modes of these two primitives anymore. And also you don't need universality of the hash. Um, so it seems better with this trick and uh, we can then we show that you can use palier based construction from Picos of Waters but actually we improve efficiency of it just make it even more efficient. And, but funny, uh, it was independently the exact same efficient Palier based constructions were discovered by Rosa and Segev very recently. So we can have something more efficient and uh, it's still not as, as close to efficiency to random oracle constructions, but it's actually not that bad. And we have security in the standard model uh, without assuming random oracles. But it's for block sources. OK, so this is about all the main results uh, we did on the public key deterministic encryption. So now, but as you mentioned, as you noticed, I was, I was going to trick you a bit of saying that deterministic encryption is what you need for the search. But it doesn't have to be deterministic. as so it doesn't have to be for the same functionality of, of this particular application. And so this is why we generalize what we need. We call it efficiently searchable encryption, this primitive, and deterministic encryption is just one particular case of it that satisfies it. Yeah? But uh, in the proof with the hashes and the RSA uh, encryption, uh -huh. how do you guarantee that you have a um, Length preserving mechanism because I see that as a 
as a nice feature of actually storing in the database because in the database actually for for if you're assuming just serial storage of it, if you don't have like preserving yeah. and you're talking about right. terabytes of data, to yeah. actually retrieve the encrypted block. That becomes an issue for upset but calculation. Just the construction was deterministic. It was length preserving. So for the case of the hash and the RSA, I, I don't see that. Hash and RSA. No, I, the length preserving one when the hashing was done kind of. So maybe I can go back quickly and we'll see. OK, this is the scheme. So uh, this is the message. Real size, <laughs> and this is the ciphertext, real size. They're about the same, <laughs> that's my proof. So, okay, so if the message is really short, you cannot use just a short RSA with, because you need to have at least 1024. But, but then probably it's not a big deal if you have a few extra bits. Right, so it cannot get shorter than the RSA key. But if it's longer, you just do it like this. This is length preserving transformation hashes on the part of the message and they inside. It doesn't increase the size of the ciphertext. And you apply the RSA, it's a permutation. You, you can stay the same size as long as it's not shorter than the size of the RSA key. It's just by construction. And all the other constructions are not length preserving. This is the only one we had. Okay, efficiently searchable encryption, just a generalization. We say you don't need deterministic encryption. Uh, we want the same functionality. So for that, we require encryption scheme to have two functions in addition have to be defined, F and G, which are used for queries and indexing. So uh, if someone sends a ciphertext, so the server will use one function, G, on the ciphertext in order to index nowhere to locate. And then whenever the query comes in, the user would use the other function f which on the message to compute the query. And the server will take it and go to the exact same index. So we ask this to, the, the results of these functions to be the same. What server can use and what the user can, so basically what sender can send and, use, and the server can use and what the receiver can use to query. In the case of deterministic encryption, both of these functions are just ciphertext basically, this whole part. In your solution, which we are coming to, it's going to be just the hash. You take the same ciphertext and hash part of it, this is your function. And you just hash the message, this is the function, and then coincide. doesn't have to be the, the whole ciphertext which is the same. It can be a part which can be used. So, but deterministic encryption is just a special case. The same security definition applies because in the definition we didn't say it has to be deterministic. Same security definitions are there. And your construction, which you saw immediately, we called encrypt and hash. You just encrypt with any randomized scheme and append the hash. And you use it for searching. And uh, it was proposed in the database literature, but we just confirmed that it is secure in the random oracle model if the hash has this ideal property. Um, also, it brings me to one question that this scheme, maybe I overemphasized a little bit the importance of deterministic encryption because for the main application we see that it's the hash what's needed. In the random oracle model, no problem. In the standard model, so it makes sense to design not the whole deterministic encryption scheme, but just the hash which has, so, so what properties? Uh, so that the whole scheme satisfy our definitions. So we see that we didn't state it anywhere, but it seems fine that for block sources, just universal hash function and the leftover hash lemma would work. Still a big open question, not much, well, 
seems easier than encryption, but still seems to be very hard to design a hash secure in the strongest sense. Still an open question, not for block sources. I don't know the solution. I know several people are trying. No results so far. We'll see. Um, good. So I have oh, just one small point here that if you use encrypt and hash construction, uh, then you can have some efficiency security trade-off. Uh, because if you don't like that you can see that where the equal messages are in the database, you can try to decrease the output of the hash, so have some collisions actually there. So several plain text will map to the same ciphertext, the server wouldn't be able to tell. It will come with the price of having more full positives, right? On each query, server, server will return more answers. Maybe preferable in some applications. And uh, so just uh, this trade-off you may have to limit the output of the hash. And I have a few minutes, and I'll, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the symmetric key setting and more flexible queries. So deterministic encryption in the symmetric key setting, we treated it too. Uh, things a bit easier there. Uh, so we had the definition and we, because things are easy, we'll start the definition, not only provide privacy, but also provide authenticity. And finding the definition is also not that complicated. So we did this. Um, our construction, what we had, just if you're interested, uh, asked to compute a MAC of the message. Uh, this is basically in place of the hash we used in the public key setting. And most MACs are PRF, so it's a good, it's a pseudorandom function. And then we use this tag, this MAC, as the IV for the CBC encryption mode. And surprisingly, it's the same construction which was used for independently for totally different I, uh, application which is called KeyWrap by Rogaway and Shrimpton. Uh, okay, yeah, so th this is uh, very briefly about the symmetric key setting. So when we did it, we were kind of happy with ourselves and uh, for example this symmetric uh, set, uh, solution we presented at the database conference, we thought they would like it. Uh, but they said, okay, but it's only exact match. It's about so we want to do all types of queries. We want to do minimum, maximum, range queries, average. Do it this too. It's not enough. We're like, okay, <laughs> one thing at a time. So we, and so what they're particularly interested about, and again, they are trying to do it themselves. Uh, they want to do range queries. So you have your data, now return me the records which contain ciphertext encryptions of from 100 to 300, something like that. Uh, and again, they had several ideas, and two ideas actually. One is, I don't, I'm not sure if it's their name, but the idea if it's, it is prefix preserving encryption. And, and imagine your plain text and numbers and in the binary form. So they encrypt everything bit by bit, and they have the property that, and it's kind of deterministic, right? So if two messages start with the same prefix, uh, uh, the ciphertext will also start with the same prefix. That's why I call it prefix preserving. And they say you can express a range, a set of numbers, uh, sometimes with just the minimum set of prefixes. Right, so, and then basically how it's called, star at the end, whatever after. So this prefix and the rest can be anything. And this prefix, and you can express a range like this. They suggested to use it uh, to answer in range queries. The other suggestion was to use order preserving encryption. Meaning, if two plain texts stay in order, one smaller than the other, the, sh the same should hold in the ciphertext. So you can sort the ciphertext and uh, 
that's all. And then if it's deterministic, you just encrypt the range and the database will return everything in between. Such a scheme exists. They, decide, they designed something. I looked at it, my student looked at it, it doesn't make any sense, so I cannot parse it. So I, and I would, no, I, even though I told them it doesn't make sense, they say it must make sense because it was published in our best co data, best conference. So, <laughs> and I say, no, they say it must. It's uh, very good, yeah. All the preserving script looked almost identical to one co part code books, which I believe in the 19th century they knew how to crack. Okay, actually, so maybe uh, you can notice that it's easy to crack. So if, you, if you're in the public key setting, okay? If it's public key, if you can encrypt everything yourself, it's deterministic or the preserving. It doesn't make any sense. If you have some ciphertext, you take some message encryptive. If it's larger, you go here, encrypt it, and it kind of you will converge to the message. So I don't know how can it make sense. But they were probably talking about symmetric key setting, where it's not, uh, it, it seems to me that it can make some sense. It's not very strong security, but something can be there, right? So at, at least it's not, everything is obviously insecure. You can have some security. It's not totally obvious, but it has been broken on Kirchhoff's book with Young. But it what? What scheme? One time code books have been notoriously weak since but what is, one, what is one time code book? I'm not it, sure maybe. The, co the, the plain words and the code words are in the same order. So if you know the, if you know the, if you, so you, you find a code word, you know, ah, this must be before Alibaba and after Alibaba and before Baghdad, right? Because of alphabetic order, right? And well, it's, yeah. You can so find, you probably, well, one thing is that you, it, it, if you think about you, the ciphertext space definitely has to be way larger than the message space. It's not mm -hmm. the case in your scheme. Oh, have yeah. So if it's way larger, these simple things do not necessarily hold. In order to preserve it, no matter how large it is, I have, if, I know the, if I know two messages, I know which message is between them, which message is not, not between them. And the, right, you but you look at the ciphertext, so, and they can be way farther apart, so you... No, I think it, it may make sense. It may make sense, but... So that's what we're looking at now, so I, I don't have all the results, but we are trying to define security, seeing can you have some security, and then trying to find the schemes. Maybe, maybe we can discuss, I'll tell you our scheme, you'll try to crack it. That will be first test. Okay, that can be interesting. And also prefix preserving scheme, uh, we also had something which may be more efficient than what they had. Um, but it seems less interesting to me because when used for range queries, it actually can reveal some information. For some ranges, just looking at the ciphertext, you can know, for example, for bit by bit encryption. So uh, I'm not sure how useful it is. But order preserving encryption seems uh, interesting to me, seems to make some sense, so we can discuss it. Um, actually, there are some ideas here, and uh, it, it actually, it's interesting, it's the first time I do something when the solution has so little with crypto, it's just some probability theory, some distributions, and uh, just the question of how to efficiently sample a random or the preserving function. We'll see. And uh, that's it. So on time. So studied some security definitions for deterministic and efficiently searchable encryption. Uh, showed some relations between them. Provided construction in the random oracle model in the strongest sense and some less efficient construction, but in the standard model for slightly weaker definition. Uh, so discuss this more general primitive efficiently searchable encryption, several cons one constructions there, and discuss symmetric key setting and more flexible queries. Thank you. Thanks.
More questions? Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, in the um, in efficiently searchable encryption, don't you need the, the fact that that F and G are both non invertible without the private key? Oh, it it will pro it, it is probably implied by the security notion, but this is just the minimum syntax you need just to have functionality. But then you look at the security definition. So most probably yes, if it's not satisfied, it will not be satisfied. But it had nothing to do with the security at that time. It's just what do you need to do search, and then you later look at whether secure it or not. Yeah. This may be a very unfair question, but it seems that uh, naively that these uh, searchable or deterministic encryption are what we all of us broke in our first two years when you learned our first language. <laughs> Where is the difference? <laughs> Why is any deterministic encryption stronger than, a, than what a two-year two -year old baby can break? <laughs> and uh, so, w what is it that can break? I'm not we maybe just a... knowing no language, right? Right. And we all manage by listening around in right. about two years to learn one language. Right. For those who don't are in deep trouble. Right. right? Why is the deterministic encryption any stronger than the code two-year-old baby break? And not all two-year-olds can get can get job offers with the NSA. The, the message space is larger. It's not possible to remember it all. And you cannot go back. You just don't remember all the mappings. It's, uh, you learn... Computers can break, can, can remember all the messages. Babies maybe can't. I don't know if they can remember. But do babies learn more than they, they hear? They actually... They, they learn what they hear. Uh, they they but they here you... They get English or German or Hebrew but there or you French, French somehow. But there it's you... It's smaller vocabulary than the size of this case. Right. Here, here you, 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 hear, you hear way less than what you ask to crack, so... Maybe if you search on the full message, which must be way longer than a telephone number, because telephone numbers are just unread any of them. I, I doubt most searches are on you know telephone numbers oh, plus galaxy numbers. You just what you are saying is that in practice you will not. So our requirement that the message space is very large, a lot of Hyman entropy. In reality, yeah. So even probably my name will be you can, Alexander is not that bad. So. Right, yeah, that's a good it's point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a good point. So what it says that, look, if you want to have, if they just want to have fast search and they say, whatever the best security, that's the best security, it's not very good. The point is, if you don't have a large message space and probably you don't have it, well, then we cannot help you then you have to do more work on searching if you want high security absolutely yeah that's yeah does something have to do with the fact that in your definition of security the adversary never sees the public key it's as if the, you know the baby is trying to learn language with some critical piece of information he never gets to see i I, I somehow don't think this is the reason. It's probably more to the difference, but even without it, I'm not sure. One of the adversaries can see the public key. The other one can, yes. Who, who is asked to. Who is actually breaking this key. And that guy can encrypt everything by itself with the public key, so it's not really that thing. You see? And also you have a no traffic analysis, just knowing when a query is sent. Like the day Warren Buffett has a heart attack, you know the stock market queries will be about Berkshire Hathaway. Good question. So we actually didn't analyze the whole, sec like somehow it was security of the primitive. How it's used, for example, the server would know what it finds, yeah. right? Yeah, so all these things somehow were beyond our thing, right? They have to be treated additionally, but that's true. All, yeah, there are things like that, yeah. Yeah, all right.
Thank you.